Hi, I'm Arlene McIntyre, Creative Director at Ventura Design, and you're listening to Shut the Front Door, a lighthearted podcast that will bring you through the front door and into the homes of influential and interesting people. Home for me is one of the most important things in my life. My career has fortunately given me the opportunity to work closely with people and to help them create a home they will cherish forever. Rosanna Davison became a household name when at age just 19, she was crowned Miss World in China. Thrust into the limelight from that day forward and following a lengthy modeling career, Rosanna has since found her true calling in health and nutrition, having qualified as a nutritional therapist in 2013. Having witnessed firsthand the pressures models are under to look a certain way, Rosanna's experiences during this time helped her to form her approach and philosophy to food. This has resulted in her best-selling book, Eat Yourself Fit, and her acclaimed website and blog, rosannadavidsonnutrition.com. Most recently, Rosanna has opened up about her journey to become a mom. Speaking openly on The Late Late Show, she shared her story, which has lifted many taboos around the topics of pregnancy, infertility, and surrogacy in Ireland. Her bravery has helped many women across Ireland beyond feel less alone. Rosanna, thank you so much for joining us today on Shut the Front Door. Thank you. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. And I'm just delighted to be here chatting to you. Um, how are you finding the lockdown? We we all have kind of good days and maybe days that are more difficult. Um, it's not, to be honest, a whole lot different for me anyway, since Sophia was born in November, um, because I have spent most of my time at home with her. But obviously we really miss our families and it's it's sad that our parents aren't kind of around her and you know seeing her grow and develop because she seems to be changing by the day at the moment um but on the positives it's great to have Wes home from work he's um obviously had to close his business at the moment uh, so it's great to have the extra pair of hands to to help with nappy changes and feeds and he's really enjoying the the time with her as well so I think it has its positives and its its negatives as well but ultimately we're just you know very grateful that we're happy we're healthy we've got food you know a, a cozy home and um, while our loved ones are healthy and safe so um yeah it's fine we're just sitting it out and and hoping that it doesn't go on for you know too too much longer I suppose yeah it's 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 like it definitely has you know its blessings as well like that with Sophia and and Wes you know you have all this quality time with her now which is so perfect really Absolutely. It's it's really a lovely time to be home with a baby. She just um, turned five months a couple of days ago. Um, so it is a lovely time to, to be spending um, all this quality time together at home. Um, but as I said, it's just that our parents are missing out. They're cocooning in their own houses. Um, but, you know, on the plus side, we've never been in touch as much as we are now. We've never had as many Zoom chats and, you know, FaceTime calls and phone calls. So I think we're connecting on, on that sort of level um, while not seeing each other. And, uh, you know, I think lockdown, I think this whole experience has put things into perspective for a lot of people and made you realize what's important in life and what's not. And, you know, it's not that important to get dressed up and go on nights out or go out for meals or go to the pub and things like that. You know, while they're they're nice to do and, you know, it's lovely to meet up with friends and go out. Exactly. I've been following you on Instagram uh, over the last couple of weeks and I see you've been having house parties with your family. Yeah, we've had some great fun. I suppose it's, it's funny because my two brothers live in London with their partners and they have done for years and we've never actually thought to do family Zooms before um, lockdown. So we're really enjoying just, we sit there for a couple of hours. We do quizzes, you know, we might have drinks or people just go off and cook and we kind of chat as we're cooking. So it's been a lovely way to connect. Um, and we just can't believe we didn't think of it before. I know. I know. It's great. And of course, they get to see little Sophia then. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, my brothers haven't seen her since Christmas and she's obviously kind of doubled in size since then, if not more. And my parents haven't seen her since it was around the start of March because um, we've been home, I think, since about Friday the 13th of March was yep. when the initial suggestions to sort of stay home started. So, you know, it's it's hard for them because my parents would have called in you know four or five times a week to see her or I would have called over to them before this and and my mom was great by taking her if I was working and you know it's it's a you know they miss her a lot it's a big thing for them not to see her but and yeah. um, we're all doing our best and and hopefully all helping to um you know reduce the impact in this country of the virus 
definitely it's a it's a real big struggle for so many people i mean all we can do is our best you know it's absolutely tough. yeah and support each other and support each other for sure um rosanna i have so many questions for you today so oh. <laughs> <laughs> i'd love to start with your childhood memories of home can you share some of those with me goodness where to even begin um well I grew up in a lovely house in Dorky, which if anyone knows Dorky, it's just a beautiful seaside um, town, I suppose. I wouldn't call it a village now, but um, it was a lovely place to live. And we, we grew up in a house um, very close, I mean, two minute walk from Coleymore Harbour. And I've, yeah, lovely memories of spending a lot of time out in the garden. We never had any sort of video games. Obviously, the internet wasn't around when I was a, a child mm -hmm. in the 80s. So my childhood was very much about the outdoors um, and then did a lot of sort of fun things like baking with my mom. Um, my dad was great for bringing us on sort of surprise trips, whether it would be going down to Wexford to visit my grandmother, um, who still lives down there. Hmm. she's nearly 94 and um she's she's great she sends me emails all the time um really so I've, yeah I've great memories of just a really outdoorsy childhood um yeah so really happy memories and I mean if the house was filled with music no doubt it was I mean I suppose people have this idea sometimes that my dad's there playing the guitar all day or the piano and yeah he would play on certain occasions especially Christmas is a great time um, yes. to get everyone around the piano and play some tunes but he actually had a purpose-built recording studio um, in a part of the garden so he used to go down there and record his music um, but definitely I mean I used to play the piano growing up my brothers played various in instruments from kind of the recorder to the oboe to the saxophone so we, we were all sort of musical in our own ways I don't think any of us play anymore unfortunately uh, we do have a piano in our house now but um, I've forgotten nearly all of it sadly and does your dad play music to Sophia he does um a lovely moment actually was when we brought her home from Kiev in early December and my mom and Wes and me had been over there for a couple of weeks, well, nearly a month while she was born. And when we got through Dublin airport, my dad was waiting and he hadn't met her. Obviously, it was his first time meeting his first grandchild. And he sang her a song and it was just it was a lovely moment. And he does sing to her. Um, he was only singing to her a couple of days ago, actually, over um, a FaceTime chat. I think he just wants to make sure she remembers his voice and you know, grows up with music. Yeah, that's so sweet. And what was your own bedroom like in your home? Um, it was, well, growing up, rather than now, do you mean? Yeah, when you were... <laughs> now it's full of baby stuff. Um, <laughs> growing up, it was quite girly. I had pink curtains and pink and white wallpaper and two single beds and loads of teddies. I wasn't ever really into dolls, but I loved stuffed animals. Mm -hmm. So um, I had loads of teddies, which I think made me sneeze in the morning. I was probably allergic to the dust. <laughs> and um, yeah, I loved my bedroom. Actually, I used to collect lots of little trinkets and ornaments and bits and pieces um, and pop them up in the shelves. And then actually, Wes, we were only looking through childhood photos of mine a couple of days ago. And Wes was slagging me about all the pictures I had in my teenage years of Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, yeah. It was around the time Romeo and Juliet came out. And I suppose I was a young teenager and just thought he was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. So I had all these pictures, not just one, about 20 of them up on the wall. And colours. What kind of colours did you have in your in your childhood bedroom? Uh, mostly pink and white, pale pink and white, pale pink oh, carpet. Uh, and, and carpet. So pink, white, carpet, loads of stuffed animals and Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Only later on. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like a, your teenage room. That's when you were kind of going into the teenage yeah I think okay. I yeah just discovered boys and movies so he was my object of desire for a year or so <laughs> but, um, yeah. it's funny to look back on no totally and you're not the first one to say Leo funny enough he, he's really he, yeah he seems to be um popular with a lot of a lot yeah, of it was around yeah as I said Romeo and Juliet and Titanic and those yeah, kinds true. of movies 
Yeah, tr- so true. So when did you start traveling and uh, and when did you when did you rather start getting into modeling? When did that begin for you? Modeling started in I suppose UCD. I was in first year in UCD and I got involved in the UCD fashion show which was an amazing it was a huge production um held in the RDS and you know it was just I have amazing memories of that time but um through the fashion show they held a competition for Miss Hawaiian Tropic so they would select the Irish representative to go off to Miss Hawaiian Tropic in Hawaii and I was selected to go Um, but I actually in the end I turned it down because it clashed with my first year university exams and I just thought if I don't do them I'll have to repeat the year and is it really worth it kind of thing so I declined um, and a couple of months later I ended up um, being entered into Miss Ireland via um, Miss Dunleary, the Miss Dunleary competition. I had been in a shopping centre in Dunleary one day, um, just, you know, I think I was 18, minding my own business, and a girl came up and said they were recruiting um, people for this Miss Dunleary competition to be held that weekend. And I said no, thank you very much to her because it wasn't really something I wanted to get involved in. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, was quite persuasive. So I ended up heading long, just I suppose for a free night out, a few free drinks, and ended up winning Miss Dunleary, um, which put me into Miss Ireland. That was the summer of 2003. And then um, through that, then entered Miss World, which was December 2003. I suppose the rest is history. Wow. So it was a sort of an accidental entry into the modeling world, which is funny to think back on. But it was just an, like absolutely incredible. Were you excited at the time or, I mean... I, you, oh, I was. I mean, was. Yeah. Yeah, it was an incredible experience. Um, the Miss World experience. Um, well, I, I took a year out from my studies at UCD for really the year of 2004. And when I was kind of 19, 20 and traveled the world with them. I mean, we went to some incredible places, um, mainly raising money for children's charities like Variety International. But we went to places like Addis Ababa, um, Sri Lanka, um, Canada. I spent a lot of time in China. I used to, I mean, bless the energy of youth. I used to go to Beijing for the weekend or different parts of China wow. just for a weekend. And uh, it was no bother to me to do these long haul flights. Um, and I traveled mostly on my own and then met representatives from Miss World organization there. And um, where else? We went to Toronto, um, the United States, all around Europe. Um, wow. You know, it was really an amazing year for, for someone in their um, kind of late teens, early 20s. It was just an incredible adventure. I can't imagine. And then when, at what point then did you decide that you wanted to get into nutrition and, um, and, and write a book, Eat Yourself Beautiful? Um, It was, I've always had a a keen interest in human physiology and biology. It was my favorite subject in school. And um, I knew at some point it it would be something I'd get into. I wanted to be a a physiotherapist or study sports nutrition at some point. So I always thought I would. Um, But it was in, funnily enough, in UCD, I ended up studying sociology and history of art. And actually, when I Uh, finished up my exams in UCD I was offered a PhD scholarship in sociological research which um, you know it was lovely to be offered but it wasn't the area I wanted to go into because I knew at some point I wanted to study something to do with sports or nutrition Um, so I you know turned down the offer spent a lovely few years traveling and um, modeling and um you know, exploring the world. And then in 2010, I signed up for a three-year course in nutrition in Dublin, mm-hmm. um, qualified then as a nutritional therapist in 2013. I think, well, my graduation was early 2014. And then it was 2014, I was approached by Gill Books uh, to write my first book, Eat Yourself Beautiful, which was published in 2015. And following that, then they um, asked me to do a second book, Eat Yourself Fit, which um, the I had a year turnaround. It was a quick one. Um, and anyone who's written a book before will know that, you know, you do have to dedicate a, a year or so to it. Um, it took me, and I, you know, I wrote every word of it. So that kind of book where it's more of a, a specialist subject or 
um, you know, a subject you're interested in. Um, so in my case, the book was about kind of nutrition and it was a cookbook as well with 100 recipes or so. So in that case, you know, you, you don't get a, a ghost writer, you do it all yourself. Mm-hmm. So it took me, say, two to three months to write the books. And then, you know, you go into the editing part, the photography and um, the, the printing and making sure that, that it's all smooth there are no typos everything is correct yes. and then you know the promotion part in the second half of the year so it is um a, a kind of a, a big commitment but i loved it i absolutely loved every minute of writing the books and um promoting them did you come up with all the recipes yeah well at the time i had launched my website in 2015 so uh, you know as a side project i was um kind of creating recipes the whole time and they're all plant-based recipes So um, I suppose the thing about my recipes is that I don't have a lot of time or patience in the kitchen and I like to create the most sort of nutritious foods and and the easiest um, dishes and and recipes in a short space of time. So it's just about using your time well and getting, I suppose, the best nutrition bang for your buck um, with the food you eat. So that was really the basis of all of my recipes. Um, And I started really in the first half of both books. I just talk about the benefits of of certain foods and why I use them in the recipes and why it's important to include certain foods in your, your everyday diet. And then I would then create the recipes out of the foods. So, um, you know, I loved it. I I love the creative process. Um, you know, at home, I, I used to create recipes and then test them on my husband. So um, if they passed the man test and he, <laughs> he, he ate them, then it was always a good sign. But the poor guy was faced with a lot of like green sludge smoothies and awful <laughs> stuff as well that he didn't quite enjoy. But I remember one time giving him a plate of these kind of raw cheesecakes and I said try them I I think they're nice and he polished them all off you know within minutes so that was a good sign they went into the book um so um yeah so Eat Yourself Fit came out in 2016 and then in 2017 I signed up with um an international hotel group called Constance Constance Hotels who have eight um beautiful resorts across the Indian Ocean and they asked me to come on board to design recipes for their restaurants, their um, spas and their um, room service menus. So that was a, a great project. Um, just finished up with them at the end of 2019. Um, and then I just did a master's um, and ma- MSc in personalized nutrition with Middlesex University, which I finished up last year. So it's been, yeah, it's been a, a great adventure over the last few years and it's lovely to do something I think that you're passionate about and that you know you live the lifestyle every day as well definitely I'm so impressed actually I didn't realize all of that Um, Mm. you've been super busy it has been busy but I think it's I think lots of us thrive off being busy and you know as I said when you enjoy the the work and the process and um, I don't even mind the the studying part too much well, they're writing the dissertation. So I did the master's. Um, it was full time over 12 months, over 2018 into early last year. And um, if anyone has ever done a full time master's before, it's it's really seven days a week. It's mm. seriously time consuming. And writing the dissertation, I mean, I think I had six weeks or something at the end to write it. So that was um, an intense experience. I don't think I've ever done something as challenging as that before. But, you know, you do what you have to do and you get through it. And I, I think I was on about four hours sleep a night um, oh, wow. for the last few weeks. But that was good preparation for having a baby as well. So <laughs> it all helps. <laughs> Which leads me to, Sophia. <laughs> so how are you finding motherhood? You know, I'm absolutely loving it. It's just it's just a joy I mean she's enriched our lives we were only saying that this morning um it's just enriched our lives so much um if if anyone has heard our story on how Sophia came into our lives then and um, they'll know that we we just wished for her and wanted her so much for for years and to finally have her I mean we we look at her every day and we can't believe that she's ours and you know that that somebody else gave birth to her yet she's our biological child Mm -hmm. and she's at a lovely stage now as I said she's five months old and she's just full of personality and smiles and giggles and um, she absolutely loves our two little dogs 
So whenever she sees them, she gives them a big smile. And I don't know if they think much of her yet. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they'll have fun in the next few years. Yeah. But I had, we have a picture of our two dogs up in, uh, on the wall in her nursery. And whenever she sees it, she gives it a big grin, you know. So she absolutely loves animals like uh, her mum and dad. So um, it's just lovely to see her personality developing. Yeah, well, five months, really, just something clicks in at five months. Definitely all mm. of a sudden they're engaging with you and they have little personalities. They just come out of nowhere. Yeah, and she's oh, she has her feisty moments. I mean, she she definitely does, but she's a, a girl who knows what she wants, oh, which good. is important. That's good. That's exactly how you want her to be in this world. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, tell me a little bit about your home now. How are, how do you like to live at home with Wes and Sophia? And would you describe your home as um, your sanctuary? Your... Absolutely. I, I love spending time at home. Um, and thankfully, at the moment, we're doing that a lot. Um, but we've been living in our current house since 2012. And we're lucky that we live in, it's in South Dublin. And we're just lucky that we've a, a spacious enough garden to bring the dogs out running around in. And we live um, beside a, a big park as well, which is lovely. So it's a nice kind of leafy area and we can pop next door for walks as well. Keep within the two kilometer zone. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a nice spacious house. It's it's bright. We've got a lot of skylights and big windows. And we just got it um, sort of renovated last year I mean just before um, Sophia was born we kind of finished up and it started last July with a leaky bathroom upstairs and I always say that the key to a happy marriage is separate bathrooms so <laughs> we have separate bathrooms upstairs so mine is always clean and you know spotless and I have all my perfumes and products lined up and Wes's I don't even go into the odd time I might go in to give him a fresh towel but <laughs> I just keep well away from it run out of it yeah so um his shower started leaking so um he started using my shower for a while and we just said okay this can't go on like this so <laughs> let's um you know get the bathroom redone so yeah it started with kind of ripping out his bathroom and redoing it and then we decided to do mine as well because my tiles were quite old and then from there we um, thought we'd do the downstairs bathroom so we four bathrooms in the house and um, but we didn't up until last year have a bath and we thought okay if we're having a, a baby we need a bath so we we did the downstairs bathroom and then just from there um we just thought we'll we'll keep going because there are so many little things we kept noticing that we'd like to redo and mm -hmm. we thought we might as well just get it done now get the fumes and dust out before Sophia arrives um, so we kind of ripped out a, a good few parts of the house. We knocked through a wall. We replaced doors. We replaced the floor. We replaced carpets downstairs and upstairs. We repainted the whole place. We got in um, new, God, new kind of bits and pieces. Um, yeah, as I said, new doors. Um, what else? New light switches. Um, we we did a fairly hefty job between. You got all the bones right. Yeah, um, between about July and end of October, say last year, and the the building team were under pressure. You know, they were saying the baby's coming. You know, hope, hope she doesn't <laughs> well, arrive nothing, early. Nothing like a bit of pressure for for. Oh, absolutely. Um, but we're delighted we did it, and you know, we replaced the sofa with um a sofa that we were told is dog proof and baby proof, which it is. Um, it's <laughs> great. great. So if the dogs are up, their hair doesn't get kind of stuck in it. And it's it's very easy clean, um, but it looks like suede. So the amount of milk dribbles and little baby vomits that we've cleaned up off it and, you know, not a trace. So um, that's that's a tip for anyone expecting a baby is to have a look into baby proof fabrics. Yeah, we, we actually... There's a lot of mess. Yeah, we stock a few. And, a lot, and another... Um... Uh, thing that a lot of people may not know is that they're very worried they're everyone's scared of like darker tones in their home with a baby when in fact baby sick is actually very bright so brighter tones are yeah. the way to go definitely you um, know everything just disappears into kind of neutrals i think yeah it does. I, mean, I don't know about the smell disappearing <laughs> baby wipes and we've just yeah we've an awful lot of disinfectant wipes and um sprays and all that kind of thing so, um, yeah, so we're delighted we gave our gave our home sort of a fresh new look. And it's been lovely because, of course, when we came back before Christmas, we had an awful lot of visitors in the house. And I think if you're having visitors, it's lovely to feel like your home um, feels like 
exactly how you want it to look. So, um, I mean, there is more we could do. Our our kitchen is as it was when we moved in in 2012, and we would love to change up the um, countertops and um, other bits of the kitchen. But you know, it's it's another big job to think about maybe doing, and we weren't sure if we'd stay here forever so um it's one of those things to think about maybe just um just stop with the renovating and enjoy Sophia and yeah I think yeah. we'll <laughs> focus on that for now <laughs> enough work exactly exactly <laughs> sounds like you guys need a well-earned break and, and this is the perfect time to just nest and and have time together it is yeah it really so, is how do you unwind in the evenings um what when the baby goes to bed um well we try to make sure she's in bed between say well at the moment half eight and nine um we've been slowly moving her bedtime back because she originally wouldn't go to sleep until four in the morning for a while that was back in kind of january she went through a mad party phase Mm -hmm. and then more recently she went through a phase of not going to sleep until half 12 um, but sleeping through the night until half seven. But now she, yeah, now she's happy to go to bed around half eight, nine. And it, it does mean we kind of wake in the night for a feed at around three or four. Um, but she will kind of stay in bed until half nine, ten. Then that's great. So it's just about trying to get her into more of a, of a routine. Yeah, she's but still very young though. She is, but we're lucky. She's a great sleeper, you know. And, Unless she wakes for a feed, you know, there, there won't be a squeak out of her. So um, we're, we're complaint. grateful to be getting our sleep again. It was quite tough at the beginning, um, as it is for any new parent. I think you're just, you're anxious as well. Um, at the beginning, I was waking up all the time in the night um, thinking that she was on me or wrapped up in the bed clothes somewhere. Or, you know, you have that anxiety, I think, as a new parent. And um, thankfully, that's all gone. Yeah, that, that um, actually happened to me as well. I used to wake up in the middle of the night thinking she was somewhere in the bed or yeah, I would be standing on the side of my bed looking around for her. And it was just oh, insane. It happened every night for a while. Yeah. It's just this awful um, terror you get. Yeah. Um, but she, I think when they're tiny, though, and they're, they feel so fragile that you worry, she's much more sturdy um, and, and big now. So I wouldn't be as worried. Um, oh, she looks so cute. Oh, she's she's a little dose and she's a nice mixture of the two of us. Really? Um, but she is very like her dad. Um, mm. She's probably, she, although she's very like me as a baby as well. I've been digging out a lot of baby photos mm-hmm. and she's kind of got the same shaped maybe face and head as me and very similar eyes. And then she's got her dad's mouth. So it's a nice mixture. I never answered your question about unwinding in the evenings. Um, if yeah, if we do get her to bed at that kind of time, then we'll just flop onto the sofa and watch something on Netflix or um, read or you know do a Zoom chat with the family, that kind of thing. And I've noticed that you've kept Sophia uh, her identity very private, and and I think that's that's wise. But yes. does social media play a big part in your life, Rosanna. Well, well, just to answer the first part, we. We knew a long time before she was born that we would um, protect her by hiding her face. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not going to hide her completely because she's she's our whole life now, pretty much. Um, So I do obviously show her, but we just feel that it's for her own security and and privacy, really. And, you know, the Internet can be a dark place, so we just want to protect her. And we feel a responsibility, obviously, as her parents to protect her for as long as possible, hopefully until she's able to make up her own mind about whether she shows her face. But also we love the idea that, you know, we grew up as children in a time without social media or internet at all so we want to give that sort of gift to her of not having to have any sort of online presence um, if she doesn't want it and each to their own you know uh, I have friends who love to show off their kids and I think it's just a personal decision Um, but it was one that Wes and I agreed on Um, so and then social media I think is well, not so much for Wes, he's very private, but it is a part of my life. Um, it's, a, it's a part of my career. It's so much of sort of business is done online as well. But, you know, I think social media has so many benefits from connecting people, especially at the moment, to, um, you know, 
helping to connect businesses and promote businesses and messages and Mm -hmm. providing support for for different people but obviously it has its negative sides as well so um, but it's getting better I mean I don't you know touch wood I don't get any kind of negativity online um, and I think people are much more aware of what they say um, on social media and on the internet hopefully in general and that it, you know social media needs to be a place where we can support each other as a community and look out for each other and you know provide some kind of comfort to those that need it so I think it is particularly at the moment I'm seeing it being used for all the right reasons. That is so true. Definitely now people are, I think we're all just coming together with Mm. the whole COVID thing, which is a good thing. Yeah, Yeah. it's funny actually, because if I haven't been out of the house that much at all, really, Wes does any kind of shopping we need to do if we can't get a slot online, which has been difficult at the moment. Um, But if I do have to go out for anything, um, I, you know, you really notice that people keep their distance hugely. You just you barely even look in someone's direction. I'm doing huge loops around people. You know, I wouldn't go kind of near them in the supermarket aisle. I'm, I suppose we're being really, really cautious because of Sophia. Yeah. Um, because, you know, if we, we both get sick, then who looks after her? Um, but it's funny how it's, you know, this whole crisis has has sort of brought people apart so much in the physical sense but brought us so much together emotionally and technologically and in so many other ways so it's it's a funny sort of dichotomy it is and everyone's Um, looking out for everyone and and suddenly you're connecting with your neighbors and you know learning new things about them that you never knew before it's it's actually incredible it is and I think in that way it came at the right time um yeah a neighbor actually has just had a baby yesterday mm. and so everyone is kind of reaching out to her and making sure she's okay and it's just a, you know it's a tough time to have a baby right now it is yeah she one of my best friends had a baby a couple of weeks ago and her husband was allowed in for the delivery but then had to leave and couldn't visit mm. you know again for the time that she was in hospital so it is I mean she was obviously lucky that he was there for the important part but it is tough when you need that support um, definitely someone to be there and tell me about your morning ritual Rosanna how does your day start for you I know Sophia plays a big part in all of this yeah. well yeah it depends on what time her her feeds are but usually she'd have her first feed of the day at about half seven eight and most of the time she wants to go back to sleep until about 10 10 30 yeah. So I'd feed her in bed, you know, keep the lights low and keep it very calm, put her back to bed. And then I would get up and have a shower um, and really go downstairs, um, have a coffee. Very important. And then I try and just get the bits and pieces of housework done that I need to do. So I would usually, you know, wash her bottles and sterilize them Um all the boring stuff, do the laundry. Um, obviously, with the baby, there's quite a bit more laundry to be done. Um, I'd usually... I'm, particularly kind of um, anal I suppose at the moment about making sure the floors are really clean and disinfected especially with the dogs running in and out so I'd usually um, wash the floors do a bit of hoovering all the fun stuff and then buy um, and then send emails or do any kind of work related stuff that I have to do and then usually by 10 to 10 30 she wakes up so bring her down change her um, she might, you know, play on the, the play mat for a bit, do a bit of tummy time. Um, she might want to feed again. So um, then, you know, I've kind of got all the bits and pieces done so I can give my time to her. So, yeah, that's usually our morning routine. You're very hands on, which is very refreshing to hear. I like your. Yes, absolutely. Um, before she was born, I was given the number of a night nurse and I thought, oh, wouldn't that be lovely? Well, got a good night's sleep a couple of times a week and we'll we'll do that and when she was born I just thought no I don't want anyone near her I want to do it all um you know we'll do it all together so yeah we haven't had any help so far and we just managed to um work well as a team you know I'd take her for a few hours then Wes would take her for a few hours or we'd do it together um he has had to close his business obviously at the moment but he still has to take various work calls and and send emails as well so if he's working I'll take her so yeah we've developed a good kind of routine and a good balance together and then later in the day she usually goes for a nap at around lunchtime 
Yeah. Um, so that could be for 45 minutes to an hour. So we'd have a bit of time then to get something to eat or you know, have a cup of tea or the weather's been so good at the moment that we have a nice kind of terrace area outside with the barbecue and garden furniture and, and parasol. So um, it's a nice chance to sit outside. So, um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's a lovely pace of life at the moment. And I think it'll be a shock when hopefully we return to normality and we have to, you know, you know, dress and dress up again in, in non lockdown clothes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to figure out how to dress in normal clothes and not tracksuits and leggings. It's gonna be a shock. <laughs> it's gonna be a shock for everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. I've forgotten. <laughs> I know. And Rosanna, since you've had Sophia, have you found that a lot of people have been reaching out to you uh, with you know to get advice on how to start the surrogacy process? Yes, um, we had a really overwhelmingly positive response when we shared our story um, last year. And then um, I was on the Late Late show in February talking about it as well. And it really opened my eyes to how many women and couples out there have their own fertility struggles, whatever they may be. And I think no matter the journey you're on, your emotions are sort of similar in, in the sort of sense of loneliness and fear and and trauma you feel if you've lost a pregnancy or, or multiple pregnancies. And, you know, it's a, it's a scary, frightening feeling um, watching the world go on around you. The world's very much designed for children and families and, you know, watching your friends have their families and, and feeling like it might never happen for you. So it's, it's, you know, I feel so much empathy and compassion for anyone going through fertility struggles um, anyone who longs for a child and it isn't happening for them and particularly at the moment and I've, I've spoken about this recently on Instagram just my heart goes out to to couples who maybe were were scheduled to go through say an IVF cycle or a fertility treatment um, before the the closures and lockdown happened and you know their plans have been put on hold indefinitely and it's it's just tough especially if if time isn't on your side and you're you're keen to get going so that's so true I was thinking that too it's it's just very prevalent and we were so lucky and we say this all the time we were so lucky that Sophia was born just before this kicked off in kind of end of November and she was born and you know we got her home before Ukraine was locked down and before all of this happened so um it, it could have been very different we could have been a few months delayed um it may not have worked first time for us so we're, we're so lucky it did and it all worked out and we have her now um so you know people did reach out we got so much love and positivity and support from people and yeah as I said it just really opened my eyes to how many of us out there have had struggles or are going through struggles it's um, maybe something that isn't discussed enough and I suppose part of my mission in sharing our story so publicly was to let people know that um, it's okay to talk about it it's really important to talk about um, fertility struggles you may be going through and um, please don't go through it alone because it's such a difficult lonely process and to always reach out to talk to a trusted fa friend or family member, even if you're a couple going through it. Because, you know, me and Wes obviously went through it for a few years and had multiple losses. And we both processed it differently. And, you know, I would be much more, I suppose, openly emotional about things. And he would bottle things up. And within a couple, you have different ways of dealing with kind of trauma. So it's really important to have somebody outside of that to, to talk to and to um, just you know share your thoughts and emotions with so you, you um, must be a very positive and a strong um person I, yeah i would say i'm i'm fairly tough um i i'm good at seeing the positive side and things and always looking for um the positives in a situation and you know i really appreciate how lucky we are and that we're in a, a good situation you know that we had the means to to go through surrogacy um so, yeah, I'm, I'm good at always seeing the positives in, in every situation. Definitely. And, and fair play to you for pursuing it. And, you know, you need a lot of determination. It's, it's It can be very harrowing, the whole experience. Also, surrogacy is not an easy process. And anyone who's who's been through it will, will know that. Um, you know, it took a, a full year of um, blood tests and scans for both of us and a huge amount of paperwork 
to get through. Um, it was the, the year I was doing my master's. So um, my, my daily schedule involved probably going to the GP for a blood test, coming back, doing lectures, you know, writing an essay, writing emails to the surrogacy agency. So it was it was an intense um, year in that respect. There's an awful lot of, as I said, paperwork and blood tests to get through to ensure that you're you know, healthy enough to go through the process, to go through the um, egg retrieval process, and then obviously to put your biological, um, I suppose your, your, no, your biological material into another person, you have to prove that you're, you don't have any infectious diseases or, or, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. So we had to go through all of that. Um, but, you know, it's absolutely worth it. It's worth every single needle in the end. Um, as anyone who's been through IVF successfully as well will tell you, it's absolutely worth it. And I'd do it again over and over if it meant having um, a child. Yeah, definitely. And what was it like that first moment when you brought Sophia home, when you brought her out of the car and you walked through your home door for the first time? What was that moment like for you? Oh, I'll never forget it. It was... So we were in the car with my mum and dad, Wes, me, Sophia, and we had her obviously in the middle of the car seat. And we arrived home, I'm trying to think, it was probably evening time around, it was early December, so yeah, it was dark. Arrived home and Wes's family were there in the house to greet us and his mum had very kindly um, decorated the house with Christmas tree decorations. There were balloons everywhere, you know, saying congratulations on your baby girl, we had all sorts of of welcome you know bits and pieces so it was it was very special I mean it was the the two families together um Sophia was fast asleep I don't think she really even opened her eyes um but yeah it was it was just a really incredible moment to bring her home after everything absolutely yeah huge and that first night I bet you couldn't sleep a wink but you were just like Staring yeah, at her I mean, I had left everything ready. I'd left her, um, she, she sleeps in a cot beside my side of the bed. So I'd left everything um, ready to go. And so, yeah, it was amazing to bring her home and put her into her own bed in her own home. And, you know, I, as I said, I'd left everything ready to go. So we brought her into her own little nursery to change her and feed her. And, um, yeah, it was very special. Wow. And are you a super organized person? I am. I'm one of these annoyingly efficient, organized people. (laughs) You must Um, be. Yeah. So I think, I think though it's part of, I don't know how I kind of deal with at the moment. Anyway, I'm noticing that if I feel anxious about the situation, I end up doing housework. So I don't know if it's a way of controlling anxiety about situations. I end up, being super organized and um making sure the house is spotless I'm a bit of a clean freak but I yeah I've always been like that and I suppose it's just the way I can I can have a clear head about things as well I think you know if your house is tidy and clean then mentally it's it's easier yeah and knowing where everything is and just feeling like everything is organized helps relax you of course and it does that's yeah. really important I kind of need that and how is uh, how are you planning on spending Christmas this year? God, I haven't even thought that far ahead, to be honest. I mean, hopefully this will all be in the past and we'll all be t- able to get together. Actually, I was only saying to Wes a couple of days ago that isn't it great that it didn't happen, you know, here just before Christmas. Yeah, just gone. so and, true. You know, Christmas would have been cancelled. So, um, yeah, so this year... I mean, obviously having the whole family together is what we want. Um, my brother recently got engaged um, to his girlfriend. So um, that's, the, well, they won't be getting married until probably late next year with everything going on. But, you know, it's a, we haven't had a chance to celebrate their engagement or anything. So, you know, just having everyone together is, is the most important thing, um, probably in my parents' house in Wicklow. Oh, lovely. And, um, yeah, we haven't thought that far ahead. I mean, if we're all able to travel again, it would be lovely to think of getting away for a few days, sunshine. But, um, yeah, it's, um, there's no point in planning anything really at the moment. And who have been your role models in life, Rosanna? You know, I think, I think my grandmother is a big one. I, I mentioned her earlier that she's um, almost 94 and she lives in Wexford. 
and she's very good with technology. She emails me a lot and I email her pictures of Sophia. Um, we got down just before Christmas or sorry, just after Christmas. Um, so she could meet Sophia, but we haven't been able to go down since. So the, one of the first things I'll do um, when all this is over is go and visit her. And yeah, she's just an amazing person. She's had a really incredible life living all over the world. She worked as a spy during the Cold War. Really? Um, with my grandfather. I only found out this 10 years ago um, when I filmed Who Do You Think You Are? That cool. <laughs> for RTE. But we discovered that, um, yeah, during the Cold War, she and my grandfather, who, um, well, is dead now, but he worked as a British diplomat. Um, they were stationed in Malta and it was their job, well, it was her job to decode Morse code in the, in the dead of night as part of um, the project they were working on. Uh, so yeah, she she worked as a spy. She ran a hotel. She bred racehorses. Um, she's had a really fascinating life, and at she the moment, we're, um, yeah, she's an amazing lady mm-hmm. and just a tough cookie. Yeah, I love as well. her. And so I've learned a lot from her. Um, and I think my love of animals comes from her as well. She's um, you know, she's a big animal lover. Um, she ran a farm for years. Um, she's just a really fascinating person and. Luckily, her, her memory is still excellent. So um, we spend a lot of time listening to her stories. And, um, you know, at the moment, we're trying to rec- um, record her speaking and telling her stories. So we have the recordings then forever. That's a great idea. Is she, yeah. is she your dad's mom or your mom's mom? Yeah, my dad's mom. Wow. Yeah. So I just feel very lucky to still have a grandmother. Yeah, gosh. And she's a great mm. age and she sounds like as sharp as a tact. She is. Yeah, her brain is is excellent. Excellent. Well, yeah. the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree there, Rosanna. No. <laughs> That's where you get your skills from. Your, <laughs> um, and where do you see yourself in the next five years? Um, let me see. Next five years, I would, <laughs> I had, um, I've always wanted to do a PhD um, ever since I was offered it in UCD. So I, I love the idea of doing a PhD, even though I've, I'm no, under no illusions about how much work it would be. Um, but if I don't do that, I would love to open, I've spoken about this already um, recently, I would love to open some kind of clinic that specializes in nutrition and um, health or, you know, pursue that area of, of kind of my interests um more um although for the you know foreseeable future i suppose i just want to focus on um sophia and um being her mom um if we're lucky enough to have a second child then um you know we we hope to have a sibling for her yeah well that would so be that, a real blessing yeah i mean that's something we hope to to focus on in the next year or two are you a spiritual um, person rosanna I am. Um, yeah, I would say. I suppose I don't talk about it that much because everyone has their own individual sort of beliefs. But um, yeah, I would be. Yeah. So you believe in mindfulness and kindness yeah, and all those absolutely. things. Absolutely. And well, positivity and mindfulness positivity. and yeah. um, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think, I think um, it's important because, you know, obviously you, you, you've... you've you had you've been drawing off a lot of strength internally to get through all that you've been through. Yeah, I did a lot of work, I suppose, on myself. Uh, certainly, around two thousand and seventeen um, was a challenging year in that respect. So, yeah, I did a lot of you know self reflection, um, a lot of work on sort of understanding myself um, and I think that is important for us all for you know none of us get through life without our challenges and for sure without our, our various difficulties so I think um, the way you respond to them is so important um, that's true because you know as I said we don't get through without them so we have to learn to respond to them in a way that's positive and in a way that you know we can get through them definitely you know and tough experiences just make you a better person you know, you're more insightful and it gives you, you know, a, a much larger perspective on life, you know, which is, is fantastic for you then to pass all that wisdom on to Sophia. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so what advice would you give to your younger self? I would, I suppose, advise myself not to um, stress over things not happening or, you know, I, I do believe now with a bit of um 
I suppose reflection um, that you know things happen for the right reason at the right time and you can't force anything if it's not the right time for it to happen so I think looking back on my life everything has unfolded um at the right time um yeah and as I said for the right reasons so I think to to have trust and have faith in um the timing of life is important oh I love that not to rush things yeah, that's really good. That's a great answer. Mm. And my last question, if your home was on fire and you had three things to save, okay, and Wes and Sophia are obviously outside with the dogs, <laughs> what would those three things be? Funnily enough, I was only thinking of this a couple of days ago because as I think I said I took out all these childhood photos. I have them in a big... Um, sorry, I dropped the mic. Um, I have them in a big... Um, plastic folder so I was thinking god if if anything happened to the house I'd definitely save this big folder of childhood photos because I think they're so precious obviously nothing was digital at all back then so these are all I have so definitely my childhood photos Mm -hmm. um what else I'm not massively into material things I mean yeah I've got some nice shoes and bags and things but I, I don't have any sentimental relationship with them um, I suppose my computer, because then again, you know, that also holds lots of photographs and yeah. um, memories in, in that respect. And um, what else? Maybe some jewellery. I um, have some jewellery that has great sentimental value as well that, you know, my grandmother has given me or um, that's been given to me for birthdays that were important. So, yeah, I suppose those things. Anything with sentimental value, I think, is important. And can I just do something separately with you, which is the yeah. quick, quick fire questions where I'm going to ask you a few questions just for fun really quickly. Okay. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Tea or coffee? Can I say coffee in the morning and tea in the afternoon? <laughs> and even? That's, that's exactly <laughs> like me. So that's okay. Uh, bath or shower? Shower. Text or talk? Text. Bedside left or right? Oh, left always. Morning person or night person? I'm morning. I like an early morning. Taxi or walk? Walk. Home or abroad? Oh, at the moment I'm dreaming of a holiday, but... I am a home bird, so I'll say home. <laughs> high street or couture? Oh, high street. Eat in or take out? Uh, eat in. News or Netflix? At the moment, news. I'm keeping up to date and everything. Wine or bubbles? Oh, bubbles. Yoga or Pilates? Pilates. Kanye or Donald Trump? <laughs> what a question. Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Rosanna, for joining me today. And I've absolutely loved chatting to you. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a a great chat. I wish you well and um, all the best to Sophia and Wes and stay safe. Thank you. You too.